Hello, good morning. Good morning. If you could all take your seats, please. Thank you very much. So welcome, welcome back. Welcome to the second day of this Automotive Logistics Europe conference. I um, uh, hope you all had a, a good day yesterday and uh, of course enjoyed the, uh, enjoyed the, the dinner upon the uh, Rhine Princessen. Uh, I understand that nobody fell into the river, so that was a good thing. Uh, although I did see a couple of people were quite close to uh, maybe not falling in, but maybe being pushed in. Uh, but Louis, you're still here, so we're all good. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed yesterday's uh, sessions and the speakers, so we wanted to thank you all for your participation there. And we look forward to, of course, having a, a stimulating day today as well. Uh, firstly, before we start, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Of course, uh, we're, we're interactive here, so you can certainly do that by logging in uh, and using the conference app. Uh, so the, the details are, are here for, for you to, and the instructions for how, how you can download the app and interact. There are, of course, uh, uh, questions uh, that you can pose through the app, uh, and of course, network and use it to interact with the other people attending the conference as well. Uh, and of course, with that, uh, uh, we'd also like to request your feedback. Uh, so you have uh, feedback forms on, on the tables in front of you, and of course, you can use the app to uh, submit your feedback, and there's a feedback form on there as well. So uh, please do that. Uh, we really uh, welcome your feedback, and of course, it's important for us to be able to help improve what we do uh, and help service you better as well. Um, just one other thing on that, uh, there were some glasses handed in uh, to us yesterday that we found. So uh, if they're yours, then uh, please make your way to the registration desk or, uh, of course, ask somebody to guide you there. Uh, so let's begin with this uh, session. Uh, this next session is looking at investing in the future. Uh, as uh, Mary Barra put it from General Motors, we'll see more change in the next five to 10 years than there's been in the next 50. So the automotive and logistics sector are evolving at a rapid pace. And at the heart of this change is an evolution in technology, driving innovative business models and disrupt disrupting traditional players. So understanding what to invest in uh, has the potential to reap huge rewards, but also comes with huge risk as well. So we've got a, a great panel of experts here to, uh, to discuss some of the, 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 the trends in investing, what that means in terms of building a startup, growing that, nurturing entrepreneurship within your organizations. So uh, we'll be looking into some of those Please give that, give that some consideration yourselves as well, because it, as I said, this is an interactive conference, so feel free to participate, ask some questions, make some comments uh, to the panel once they've delivered their presentations, and let's have a, a, a fruitful discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker, who's uh, Johannes Nunning, who's the founder and head of Ucubate from Deutsche Telekom. Thank you very much. Good morning. You okay to stand up? I go there. Stage is yours. Okay. So thank you for having me in the introduction. Uh, so I run the Ucubate program at Deutsche Telekom, and I will uh, walk you through this briefly in a few seconds. Uh, but let me, uh, you know, ask uh, answer this question: uh, How to invest? Uh, very briefly in the beginning. So for me, it's most important to invest into people, right? Be it your own people or be it maybe startup founders when it comes to, you know, uh, conquering the future. So you can believe in your own people, the innovators in your company, support them to help them realize their ideas or invest into startups or maybe M&A targets. Uh, I think the, you know, it all comes down to, do you have the right people on the bus um, and assess that carefully. Um, so that's the bottom line. 
So what is Ucubate? Uh, it's an internal incubator. So we support telecoms employees to realize their ideas as an open platform. So if you're an employee of Deutsche Telekom, you can turn to me, apply for the three months uh, period we can offer uh, to have full time to realize your idea, take it to the next level. Um, and uh, we will help you to, to do so. And if you find people from the outside world, like maybe a friend or a colleague from another company you have worked before, somebody you trust, it's, it's fine with us. Because you know, different from as a corporate guy, where you are forced to work with your colleagues more or less, as a startup or as an innovation project, I believe it's important that people work together voluntarily and that you, in this sense, have to have the right people on the bus compared to those who are maybe in charge from the organizational point of view. So that's kind of the difference. Uh, I started this initiative back in 2010. Uh, we have done several iterations since then. Um, so we have supported about 200 ideas. Uh, only since last year, seven companies have been founded. Uh, 25 teams have applied and were supported with us. Uh, so about 80 entrepreneurs. Um, they have collected uh, about one million of uh, financing since last year alone. Um, and all this comes at marginal cost of zero from a corporate point of view. Right? So in a, in a way, as a corporate, and you invest in your own employees, it's like time equals money, right? So our people who can have the three months acceleration uh, phase get m m nothing, uh, only you know, up to 5K euros as a kind of a pocket money. So they are you know, put into the situation like a startup founder who is also going into garage because not it's cool, not because it's cool, but because he has no money, right? So uh, he is really you know, confronted with his own will and uh, energy and belief that this you know, world can become a better place or the industry can be transformed or maybe this little add, value add to a certain customer segment is something which needs to be in place. And uh, so why empower people and small teams? So you know, you know all we as corporations, so telecom of course, uh, we tend to be slow, right? Decision making processes, procurement processes, um, people who are in charge on holiday, you know, all this kind of stuff um, take, take time. Um, but if you start to do the work yourself, you are going to become fast. So if you do everything which needs to be done yourself, then you are getting fast. And if you listen to a customer from day one on, so really get feedback instantly, right? So get out of the building, talk to your customer segment, like exposing yourself, your idea, the problem you believe is actually uh, um, a real problem, uh, figure that out personally, right? And start to learn uh, right away. Um, so the feedback from our participants is, you know, reflects that. They say, okay, I've never learned so much in my life um, before, or in my professional life, compared to these three months. Um, and what is the outcome? So basically, um, it's new products, new customers for Deutsche Telekom, new suppliers, or new, new partners. So who am I? Uh, I work for this company, Deutsche Telekom, since uh, 20 years. I have done business administration, economics uh, as a, you know, um, a scientific education. Um, and I've been into M&A, I've done uh, corporate strategy, you know, all these big numbers, all these PowerPoint uh, stuff. I've done uh, marketing um, for business customers. I even spent some, uh, some years in the logistics industry. So in a way, I would say uh, I've been there, done that, right? So I believe I can understand how big corporations or established companies works, work. Um, and um, when it comes to innovation or working with startups or su supporting internal teams and you know, providing some kind of freedom, I believe um, that the times have changed because you know startups popping up all over the globally, right? So popping up globally, uh, you only need an internet access and a PC, and then you can you know start building uh, digital tools and services. Um, and you know you never know where this you know impact comes from. Uh, so in a way, it, it's not about being you know ready for the future. You have to be ready for the present, right? You have to act here and now, and uh, support teams and you know fill the innovation funnel. Uh, and in a later stage, maybe two years, five years, maybe ten years, you can make decisions in terms of 
do I actually acquire this company which might, be, have, which might have been founded from former <laughs> colleagues five or ten years ago? And that's what we see when we have, you know, our, our uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, companies which were born from our teams become a, a strategic partner, maybe in year two or year three. Um, it's this kind of raising new kids. It's like, you know, uh, in a way, having um, a new family member. And if you have kids, you know you cannot tell your kids, kids to you know, conquer the world, but stay at home, right? That just doesn't work. You have to provide this freedom also for these corporate startups. Um, and this boils down to the kind of magic equation. Uh, it's like innovation is a result of creativity. You know, you have to have some kind of idea or a certain angle to the reality, come up with a solution maybe others don't see. And then it's times entrepreneurship. And as a, in a corporation, it's not, you know, a lack of ideas. It's more a lack of freedom to act like an entrepreneur. Take own decisions. So our value proposition as a program is your project, your rules. Think about it for a while, right? As a corporate guy, you don't have your own rules. Of course, you, have, you only you know you stick to all the rules your company has and your you know reporting lines and stuff like that. And maybe maybe final remark: we call ourselves an open platform. Uh, and think about uh, Apple's App Store. So there are maybe 15 native apps which are being made by Apple themselves. But there are millions of apps which make this ecosystem relevant because you know the, the intelligence is decentral, right? And the energy or the specific uh, knowledge to so solve a certain problem based on this SDK and making use of Apple's devices um, is decentral. And that's pretty much the Ucubate approach. So we don't rely on the you know, executive's ideas alone. We rely on the ideas of our own people, so in the entire organization, 220,000 people, um, and also of those of the outside world, right? So our people work together with externals. Um, and as a result, it's not only product um, partner or supplier, it's also a transformation because people learn so much and this will erase blind spots, um, which you have, you know, created over the last years in this big organization. It's kind of a rebirth to those individuals and they start to do their bread and butter job differently. And that also changes the culture of your company and transformation always starts with people. And so that's basically, you know, um, I come back to the beginning of my, my speech or my, my little keynote. Um, when, it's, when it comes to investing, and making investment decisions, my recommendation is invest into people. Okay, thank you very much. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Hannes. It's uh, really interesting to see how an, an organization is uh, helping to develop its people, driving that creativity, and also investing uh, into that uh, creativity and driving that entrepreneurship. Uh, within the organization. So we'll come back and, of course, have some, have some questions for you. I think it's uh, interesting to, to drill down and to, to understand a little bit more. Of course, we were able to see some of this in action uh, when we had the, uh, the tour uh, of the, uh, the, the telecom facility the other day. So very interesting. So next up, I'd like to invite uh, Wolfgang Lechmacher, who is the director for supply chain at the World Economic Forum. So thank you very much, Wolfgang. Thanks, Nimish. Good morning, everybody. Um, first session is always very hard, and investing in the future is also a heavy topic. Um, I would like to take a very different approach. Uh, from the forum, we are dealing with a lot of macroeconomic topics, and, and I thought I, I'd talk a bit about, if you read the description, about um, how to accelerate, and what does it mean, and uh, I will talk about time, the time we are living in, the, the places which are innovative, and also what role regulation plays in this. 
And uh, then there is in the description the question around how to identify. Um, I will share with you a few, and there, there are more, a few areas where innovation is happening, uh, where entrepreneurship is happening, give some numbers to, to give you an idea of the magnitude. And at the end, uh, we all live in our realities. Uh, we have our, our package to carry, and uh, I would like to share a few action points which I think are important to, to look at, and, and depending on where you stand in the curve, you might pick the one or the other. Feel to accelerate innovation. So these were the three questions posed by Nimish and the team to us, acceleration, opportunities, action. First, I want to speak about the fourth industrial revolution, the world of interconnected systems of systems, and that we don't need to do a lot to just get on the, band, on the bandwagon and become more innovative than we have been in the last years. And then I will talk about cities, the most innovative places, and what makes them innovative. And maybe some companies can learn from that when they put together teams and then the regulation bit. So I said it already. We are living in a world of interconnected systems. Um, I very often use the electric vehicle as an example, what that means. Um, an electric vehicle is not a vehicle with just a different engine. It's a system shift in the automotive system. It has not only impacts on the automotive sector because uh, it's just easier to build. You need less engineers, probably less than half of the engineers to build an electric vehicle because it has much less moving parts. It runs longer. Because it has much less moving parts, you need much less service. So the service industry will, will suffer. Um, it runs three times more, so you will sell less cars over time. Um, so if there are less uh, cars sold, you need less car carriers, whether it's on the land or on sea. You need less spare parts. We need less oil, dependent where the energy comes from. So multiple systems are affected. It's not the automotive industry. It's a transportation industry. It's a service industry. It's even the airline industry because oil might become a speciality and very expensive. That has a impact on jet fuel and therefore on airfare. So that explains the times we are living in here. And very short, how did we get here? Um, first, we had wind powered chips. Then we had steam powered chips. We moved to oil powered chips. We moved to satellite guided chips. And now, we have interconnected systems, which means the mobility system is connected. Mobility, the movement of people and goods, is, is connected to manufacturing, is connected to retail, is connected to cities. And all that drives a dynamic which is favorable to innovation, meaning you have to expose your people, you have to expose your organization to this new world. And this new world is revolutionary. Look at the set of technologies here. We, we looked at the uh, innovation in supply chain and trade finance. And it's not one technology. There is a lot of discussion on, about artificial intelligence and about blockchain and about whatever, right? Advanced analytics. It's, and it all comes together. This slide shows the complexity. So you have artificial intelligence, advanced analytics, you have robotic uh, process automation, you have Internet of Things, you have smart contracts, all comes together to move the heavy, and we all know that, the heavy labor uh, process of letter of credits into a smart contract, a smart contract which re receives information through the Internet of Things and then automatically arranges payments. And you need a lot of technology to make that happen. The benefit is that you re reduce the process from two weeks down to two hours. And 
the price you can get through this is you suddenly can give access uh, to trade finance to people who never could afford it, who never understood it. It's the democratization of financing. And uh, the World Bank uh, estimates that the trade finance gap is 1.5 trillion US dollars. So this is a 1.5 trillion opportunity. And there are even startups saying we don't need letter of credit at all, forget the smart contract. So, but, and this is all happening. So now I'm coming to the second point, which is when we look at cities, and uh, these are communities, communities like companies, how do, do cities create an innovative environment? And, and I, I picked up these six points, right? They have a program. They have a program. They, they allow pilots. They have agile governance, right? They have a big talent pool, and they educate that talent pool. And this talent pool is diverse, and it has money. They give money. And it has infra infrastructure to connect. We heard about that. You need to bring people together. So if we look at the most innovative places in Europe, you can look through the list. And uh, London is by far the most innovative place in Europe. I come to, could come to that now. And uh, why is London so innovative? Take the six areas. London has a program for innovation and technology. London has tested autonomous vehicles. So the pot gateway project. So that was the, to, to test the interaction of machine and humans. So then the shuttles were green, um, Greenwich Island um, were, were running around and, and the, the humans had to deal with that. And it, it worked pretty well, no, no real incidents. Imagine that here in Bonn, yeah, we had uh, autonomous vehicles and maybe, maybe Bonn can do this, Johannes, you can speak to that. But that's, that's how, how uh, governments uh, set the framework, they allow product, uh, projects. Then it's an 8.7 million city. It has first-class universities, first-class schools. Not only in London, also around London, you have Oxford, you have Cambridge. It's the number one venture capital city in Europe. It's ranked seven in the world. So, and I can already prepare the world. Out of the top 10 in 2016, eight were in the US. One in Europe and one in China, Beijing. Just to, that gives you an idea where the money goes and, and where the innovation happens. So, and then uh, London has also the largest mobility infrastructure project. So let's look at the world to, to put that, give a bit of more meat to the whole story. Uh, and there is one thing I forgot, diversity. In London, London, uh, London City, 41% of the city dwellers are foreign born. So you have that diversity. You have a lot of people, very educated, foreign born. Interesting aspect in, in current times. Look at San Francisco. San Francisco is the gold standard for all things tech. Now China is, is challenging this a bit, but it, it is the, the, the mecca of, of technology. 40% foreign born. San Francisco Bay Area, 7, billion, 7 million people. And top, top university. Stanford beats every university in the world in respect to male and female VC-backed entrepreneurs. Uh, then I want to give you an idea on, on uh, you're very familiar with uh, San Francisco, on Singapore. Singapore, it's about 5.7 million people, uh, about uh, also around 40% foreign born. Four official languages. In London, you hear 200 languages spoken. Yeah. Singapore, four languages. In terms of pilots, Singapore was the first country, the first city piloting self-driving vehicles. 
It has a project to uh, test drones, although China has already a network of uh, drones. GD.com GD set up a network, 100 villages, 40 drones for deliveries. So, and I think this gives you the idea what is happening. Of course, uh, NUS and NTU are excellent universities in Singapore. So it gives you all the ingredients, and this is, and when you, when you want to know where the innovation is happening, look where the people set up their innovation center. And PayPal set in 2016, set up their first non-US research center in Singapore, and uh, P&G did it in 2017. So I think that gives you the idea where innovation is happening. You need a dense, a dense location, you need people highly educated, but they can be streetwise as well, just to make that point. You don't need only in the university people. You need people who are smart, creative, and can make things happen. On the regulation side, so what I'm, 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 I was speaking about now, which the unleashed force industrial revolution of our time, and the cities who are very innovative, in fact, they remove frontiers, they remove the boundaries, they remove borders and let people act. No constraints. The other way to get some innovation done is to set boundaries. So thinking about ICAO, the ICAO agreement, the COSI agreement about offshoring and, and carbon reduction in international aviation will force the aviation industry to come up with innovation. And now the IMO with the carbon reduction target to reduce carbon by 50% by 2050 will, will do the same. So, in fact, smart, smart places, they remove boundaries to get the innovation going and then they, they narrow them to focus it. Um, very quickly, a few numbers on, on where innovation is happening. Uh, first, everybody knows digital markets, online shopping. Uh, a four trillion market by 2020 started with people like Bezos in 1994. Automation, US is missing 50,000 drivers. These numbers might go up by, in, by 2024 to 300,000 drivers. This is a major opportunity and people like Volvo, for example, or Scania are working on this. And um, it will, uh, we know that truck platooning brings and around 4% reduction in, uh, in carbon. Brings us, I had nice pictures, but brings us to the clean opportunity. I went to a lot of shipping conferences. Autonomous shipping was not really on the agenda five years ago. Now it's, it's on every agenda. I think this is a major opportunity. This is Yara Birkeland. Yara Birkeland is a project which comes to life uh, probably uh, is planned to come to life this year, it will replace 40,000 diesel truck powered journeys. This is a carbon reduction advantage. And it's an, autonomous, it's an autonomous ship. By the way, we did a research in 2015, 5,500 city dwellers, and more than 50% believe that autonomous is anyway clean. So just keep that in mind when you do your innovations. Um, then, by 2050, there will be more plastics in the ocean than fish. So if you want to do something good, work on this. This is a project loop, it's, um, which uh, it's, it's kind of back into the future. It's the milkman coming back. It's, it's, it's providing reusable packaging. It's an entire logistics concept. I think this is a market which will take off. It's, it's not, it hasn't, to my disappointment, for, for quite some time, but I think it comes. This is San Jose, the uh, pulse center of flax. Um, this is all about Internet of Things, big data, artificial intelligence. Um, in, the, in the old days, we managed a, a few hundred suppliers, if at all. Flax managed 14,000 suppliers out of that center. They know uh, everything about the status on every production line. That's the ultimate visibility. And of course, they are dependent on people like DSV to give the data. And uh, then there will also be our interaction I, that I have to point here. This is really old fashioned, right? And working on a smartphone. This is a, 
brain-computer interface. This is uh, Alter Ego, MIT Labs. This device can, can detect and pick up your nerve signals. So if you think, next slide, next slide comes, right? So that's the future. And uh, other companies are, are working on devices which pick up um, the uh, brain signals and not only the nerve signals, which is just the our muscles. So this is just, I think, also in interesting. I believe that the whole way we, we interface with machines will change. So back to planet Earth. Um, I have been in uh, IT in the 1980s. My biggest project in 1988 was to reduce paper. 1988. I'm pretty sure if I go to back to that office, we still have paper there. So circular economy is a frustration, but this is a much bigger. Because if you talk about blockchain, if you talk about uh, artificial intelligence, you have to have a digital world. So what, whatever you do in the innovative space, get that paper out first. Otherwise, you cannot do anything, right? And data is the oil of the digital economy, which, which is happening. So you can, there's a lot of discussion about automation now. You can automate in silos, wonderful. But to extract the real value, and, and those who are in the terminal business know that you don't get a lot of value out of automation. You only get the value out of a fully integrated, connected digital system. So that's the next thing. Once you're paperless and you do a bit of automation, then you have to connect. Gartner says 20, 000, 20 billion connected things by 2020. So we need global protocols. There are a lot of implications around that. But you have to connect things. Musk has connected their 300,000 reefer containers. Took them three years. So this is where the innovation has to happen if we want to move our, our industry to the next level, get paperless, get automated, but on process level, on an asset level, get connected, and then we become intelligent. And to, to go there, I think, yes, there are the incubator, there are the innovative teams. Um, I think you need to have courage to go the new route and DSV is, uh, I, I, learned, I read that 80% uh, of the bookings come now in digitally. That's, that's a good example for, for a good start. So you have to be courageous to equip 300,000 reefer containers with sensors. And then you have to be wise to pick the right one, to scale them up. And the ones who will go after the biggest problem scale best. And then you need perseverance to keep the, keep the thing going. And along the way, please replace your systems uh, because cyber risk is also around the corner. And the older the system, the more problematic it gets. Uh, you know WannaCry and Petya created a lot of problems. So cyber is definitely, cyber resilience, a good field for job opportunities and innovation. And uh, then. You, can, you, can, you do, not, do not need to do this all yourself. You can go for partnerships. Partnership is a good way to innovate. Yeah? Go with IBM, go with Microsoft, go with others. We have seen good IT companies when we handed over the awards. And uh, so these are the people to talk to. You have to go beyond. In the fourth industrial revolution, to, to get on the bandwagon, you have to talk to people outside your universe. It's not anymore on conferences about transport, it has to be transport, automotive, it has to be IT. You have to build your new advanced technology roadmaps. And you have to be selective with your investments. And we have also to change our DNA, our way of thinking, and make it more appropriate for the digital age. And that's it. That's great. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. That's a really interesting uh, presentation. I think, uh, firstly, the, 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 clearly the pie is huge and enough for everybody. I think also uh, the, the, what you were saying in terms of the mind sh mindset shift is, is an important one to think outside of our universe and, and 
branch out into other areas and, uh, and see what's possible. So with that in mind, I'd like to invite Greg Slauson to the stage, who's Global Vertical Lead for DSV. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to make sure everybody's up. So let me, let me start with a couple questions, just to make sure everybody's awake. So we're going to get to use our, uh, our cards on the table this morning. How many, how many of the companies here today have gone through a merger, an acquisition, or a divestiture in the last 10 years? Green if you have, red if you haven't. So lots of, lots of green, a little bit of red. How many of you work for companies that are at least 30 years old? A lot of older companies. So that creates some real technology challenges for us. So DSV, we've grown a lot through acquisition over the years, 50 companies um, in about 40 years. So that's, that's a lot, right? And what that means from a technology standpoint is all of a sudden you, you step back and you realize that you could potentially, potentially be managing a portfolio of thousands of different IT systems, technologies, many of those doing the same thing. So we, we talk about accelerating innovation and, and putting our investment where it needs to be, but one of the first things we have to do is always rationalize what we have today. So, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that in the future. So that's created a lot of problems for our organizations, right? And a lot of challenges in terms of how we innovate in light of all this other activity we have, which, which is creating demand on, on our resources, whether it's financial or human, and then how do we prioritize across our organizations uh, to get the projects that we need funded. And then the older we are, um, create some other challenges, right? We've had technology platforms that have been out there running for, in some cases, decades. And how do we lift those up and innovate those or, or move off of those platforms into to more current platforms? So we'll talk a little bit about how we try to do some things at, at DSV, and then I'm very interested when we have our Q&A to learn how, how maybe your companies are, are talent, taking on those challenges. So with that, a couple things that are really important to us. One are, is our core technologies, right, and, and our core platforms. And you know, in automotive, we talk about platforms a lot. And we, we typically talk about platforms in terms of vehicle architecture. And, and there's some similarities to platforms and vehicle architecture as well as technology. The, the reason we have platforms is they bring scale to us. They allow us to bring a lot of things um, a, lot of, a lot of different products and service under a similar platform. It gives us scale in terms of our purchasing power. It also allows us, if we're smart with our platforms, to be able to put different top hats on those and, and through the same platform, offer a different customer experience. Um, but you have to keep your platforms current, right? Your platforms are gonna drive your business. They're gonna help us deliver our mission. Uh, for us, that's taking care of your freight and your, and your information, your supply chain information. Uh, so for us, our technology partners, when it comes to our platform providers, are critical. And, and you talked about collaboration. I think we've heard that a lot in the last couple days. Collaboration is really important. And it's, it's, it's more than just we find the right technology, we source it, we sign a contract, we pay our maintenance, and we're off and running. The, as, as we've heard the last two days, we were, we're living in an incredible time of of new technologies and the velocity of, of technologies coming at us, we need technology providers that we're partnering with. It really is a long-term marriage. And, and, it, and it starts with, you know, what do we want to do today and understanding, you know, what that, te that platform can pr provide, but we've also got to have that, that long-term commitment to share strategy. If, if my software provider is going in a different direction than I am, and, and we don't understand that, then, then two or three years down the road, we're gonna have a big gap and it's gonna compromise my ability to perform our core mission with that platform. So, so that's, that's key to what we're gonna do and, we're, and, and it's key to what we wanna do in terms of having fewer providers but having closer, deeper, more meaningful relationships with them. We've talked a lot about, about you know, different technologies and how they can disrupt and I'm not gonna go through them all but our approach is, is, is we want to try different technologies, um, and we're willing to fail. And we, I, I think yesterday we heard a couple times that we learn very quickly through failure. So, so we, we're not afraid to fail, but we want to fail fast. So we want, to, we want to do that early as we can in a project or a cycle so we don't invest more money and effort after something that's not going to work. Um, and we want to fail small. So fail fast, fail small. 
The other thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we're involving, when we set up a, a use case or a proof of concept, we want to make sure we don't do that in a, in a vacuum, that we're doing that with, with a lot of different stakeholders, both internally and client facing. And, and I think one of the challenges that we have typically in, in terms of technology innovation is we lock into a solution early. And we talked a little bit about this over the last couple of days, you know, blockchain or whatever. We, we tend to fall in love with a use case or a solution model. And then when it doesn't quite work out, we don't know how to pivot off of that. The, the technology still may be great and add value. It's just a different application or a different use of that technology. So we need to make sure we don't lock in and get, get too committed to a solution too early in that process. Um, and flexibility is really important. And for those, for those of us who have been with companies that are 30, 40 years old, sometimes flexibility is a difficult thing as organizations get older. Um, and then understand how those technologies that you want to bring in are going to fit into your core technology platforms and, and how you can, and, and what are they looking at? So, you know, if, if your core technology provider isn't looking at the same, you know, disruptors as you are, then there's a, there's a problem and you need to make sure you align those before you start going too deep in one area or another. So, I'm not going to go through a lot of, I mean, we've talked about, I think, every one of these, um, these different technologies in the last couple of days. A couple of things that I haven't heard um, yesterday and, and, and today is as we start to, these technologies all allow one thing. They allow us to reach out from, from different organizations to different organizations, different systems to different systems. And, and that poses a couple really interesting problems. One is data security. I'm getting deeper into my client's supply chain. I'm getting data right out of their plant, um, right out of their point of sale. Um, how do we protect their data? And how do I protect that data uh, as, it, as it mixes with other clients? And how do I make sure that, that, that we've got you know, very good um, standards for, for data protection and they have access to data? Um, and, and, and that's an important part of what we think about when we think about these technologies. The other thing that we have to think about is, is security. You know, so when we start to think about these different technologies, have they been, have, are they security hardened? Do we know that we can put them out in the field and they're not gonna get hacked? Um, and, and they've been tested and they're, 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 they're gonna meet all of the security regulations that we need and, and beyond. Because that's a hugely dynamic changing world. And, and let's face it, over the last couple of years in supply chain, we've seen some, some pretty high visibility problems with, with, with security. So, so, so it's never about the technology, right? It's always about what do you get with that technology. And, and, and for us, it's a couple things, right? It starts with everything we look at needs to reduce friction. So when, when different systems come together, different things come together, it creates, it creates drag. And how can we use technology to eliminate that? And so we always start with that idea of, of reducing friction in the supply chain, increasing velocity. Um, now, what, what did you say? Dig, digitization is the oil of the new economy? Data. Data. And, and I think that's really true, right? The faster you can move that and the more seamless those things move, then you reduce friction, you re reduce drag. And that, that has a lot of good benefits for the, the service providers. It has great benefit for our clients and the consumer. The other thing that we look at is does this, this, this new technology that we're investing in produce a positive outcome for our clients? Can we quantify the value? If, if we can do that, then it's, a, it's, it's probably gonna be a solid investment and we're gonna move forward with it and we're gonna move quickly. If we can't really quantify that, our, our, our customers say, yeah, this is interesting, but you know, yeah, then, then maybe that's not the one that we wanna, we wanna focus on. And then the other thing that's really important to us is what does it do to enhance our employees? Um, I think it's, you know, we've talked about, a lot about people still being key to what we're trying to do. We want to give our people the tools to actually think and solve problems. So if we're bringing in technology that gives them more time to focus on what's important, to solve bigger problems, to think more creatively, um, to get closer to our clients, then those are, those are technologies that we want to invest in. Um, so, so the other thing that, that, you know, a couple other things that, that are really important in terms of the principles that we try to apply, um, one is, we don't want to be a software company. Um, we want to be a smart technology company, but we don't, want to, we don't want to be the guys that are trying to build everything. That consumes a lot of resources, takes a lot of time. So don't buy, or don't build if you can buy, and don't buy if you can rent. 
So, so we, want to, we want to get to that point where we, we're more flexible, more adaptable to new technologies. And the picture, the picture to your right is what happens when you don't do that. You, you, know, you don't want to be that, that company that paints himself into a corner. And, and, and it gets hard to get out of that, right? It gets hard to, to leapfrog an old technology to a new technology because you've probably built a lot of custom interfaces, uh, portals, uh, middleware, all of those things that happen that you had to do to adapt. And, and those things make it hard to move off of that. They make it costly to move off of that. Now, I would ask everybody to, if you've painted yourself into a corner, to, to, to show me, but I won't do that. But if you've been with a company for 30 years, I guarantee you there's at least one technology out there that you've painted yourself into a corner with, and it's become very difficult to get off of that technology. And then finally, what kind of keeps us awake at night at DSV? What are we trying to think about, and what do we want to do? And the first one is, is, is around visualization. We've talked a lot about real-time visibility, but it, 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 this, is, this is so core to everything we do. If I can't see it, I can't manage it. If I can't manage it, I can't change the outcome. So, so how do we get better real-time data across the supply chain? And what are those technology platforms that we want to use, and how do those those visibility aggregators tie into my platform so that we can really present that in a way that's meaningful to all of our clients. And, and, and let's face it, I mean, a lot of tier ones, a lot of OEMs are still using systems, their, their ERP, their MRP systems could be decades old. They were built around event management, uh, so an ASN, an EDI message. So how do you, how do you create more flexibility to get that kind, of, that kind of information into their system in a meaningful way? And then, and then, you know, how do we, you know, how do we make sure that we're, we're taking that to be able to, that information, that visibility, and turn that into more predictive analytics? So being able to, to really understand what that's going to do to your supply chain. Not just when something is going to be late, but how does that affect inventory positions? How does that affect your ability to meet customer demand? And tie that into one platform that gives us that, 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 that umbrella over, over your organizations. And then, and then obviously, we want to get better at solving problems. Um, and, and the more information we have, the better it is to solve problems. Uh, and and you know, we've, we hear a lot of people talk about that, right? I mean, we're, we're all in supply chain. And for us, information is gold. The sooner we know there's going to be a problem, the cheaper I can solve that problem, the faster I can solve that problem, the better it is. And, and being able to, to not spend time trying to sort through you know, all of my problems are, are the whole universe of parts that are going into a plant, but really to be able to focus on what's, what is exactly important. And then, and then finally, how do we take the manual effort out of that? How do we make that more automated? How do we use robotics? How do we use machine, machine learning to get smarter at that? And, and at the end of the day, it's, it's really driving better, faster decisions that we never see. It happens behind the scenes automatically. So those are the things that, that really keep us thinking at night and, and, and keep us focused on what are the right technologies, what are the right innovations that we need to invest in, that we need to experiment with, that we need to get in front of our clients. So with that, Nimish, thank you. let's have some Q&A. All right, thank you very much, yeah. Thanks very much. So thank you very much, Greg. We'll uh, move into uh, the Q&A part of uh, the, the session now. But before we do, I'd just like to uh, do a quick, uh, quick straw poll. Um, who here has, has started, uh, has, has been involved in a startup? Raise your green, uh, green cards if you've been involved in a startup. All right, so very few. <laughs> we do. A couple up here. Who here has invested in a startup? Taking shares or, all right. So you can see it kind of gives us, gives us a view of the landscape, right? So of course, going into this kind of world is a daunting task, right? As you said, right? It takes courage, it takes you know, vision, you know, and it takes support mechanism, right? So maybe we'll start with that point from you, Johannes, in terms of how you go about supporting the people within your organization and help encourage you know, them to take that first leap, right? That first step into this world of, of startups and... Uh... So, I, I'm, uh, so I'm characterizing myself as an internal business angel. So maybe I'm globally the first one. 
and I would you know encourage all the organizations to also have business angels internally, which help their you know corporate entrepreneurs or employees to realize their ideas, because uh, so ideas come cheap, but innovation is blood, sweat, and tears. Right? Innovation is just pain in the neck. It's it's hard work because you know most of your attempts fail. No, most of your hypotheses won't work. Right? So the prototype fails. Maybe the customer tell you stuff you didn't ex expect. Right? So you have to you have to pick another customer segment, or uh, you would have to you know take the right uh, learnings from the conversation you had with the customers. And I would always recommend to start with a customer and you know, apply the feedback to your value proposition which you have in mind, right? So that, uh, Mark Zuckerberg says, okay, everybody knows what's true in 10 years, but nobody knows what's true this year, right? Or next year. So it's, it's about really, you know, um, learning in the first phase. Uh, the first, uh, you know, um, it's more, learning from the reality is the most important thing and that's hard work. And why um, is business angeling so important? Of course, I'm interested into generating new business opportunities for our company, so that's the business side, but it's also, that's kind of the angel side, right? Uh, so it's being there for your people, because they are typically, they are lost in the organization. You know, they have something in mind and the feedback goes like, why shall we do this? We have never done this. Or why are you coming up with this idea? You're not in charge with this. You know, you're <coughs> maybe in a uh, sales rep and you come up with a technology-based idea, whatever uh, character this idea might be, right? So, and, uh, so my role is, or I, maybe I brought myself into the role of, you know, criticizing people, providing feedback personally, but also, you know, being there in, in bad times, right? So shoulder to cry on and motivate them uh, to move on, and that's very important. And um, so maybe one last aspect. Uh, so innovation or doing a startup is an effort which requires you 100%. You, everything you are, your whole personality, your, you know, um, the, the, uh, your whole history, your network, your hobbies, your failures, your frustrations, your motives, right, so motivation. Um, and uh, that compares to this, you know, 20% you are actually um, being asked for doing your corporate role, right? So we make this 80% of extra, you know, a capacity accessible. And that's, that's just, you know, that's not, you know, um, a religion or something. It's just, it's just meaningful. It just makes sense to have your people, you know, throw 100% of their personality to, to, uh, to the project and we unlock this, uh, this capacity. Um, and that compares to startups, um, startup founders, which are also, you know, not only putting their uh, personal risk into the project, but also their whole personality, their whole time <coughs> prior one uh, project. Um, and we try to kind of mimic these uh, mechanics to the, to the um, telecom innovation ecosystem. Interesting. Yeah, I want, I want to make a few comments. First, um, we, we want to invest in the future and create the future. That, that means we need doers. Um, I think what you should look at are the people who raise their hand when you say, we, we have a new project, who wants to run this? Right? And the people who say, I, I want to do that, these, these are the right people, right? It's not the most creative and, and coming up with ideas. That's the next point. If you want to do change in the future, it's not about innovation. It's a lot about adaptation of technology and improving your, your organization in the right way. Uh, something new doesn't need to be a great idea. Just, just become paperless. I, I think if, if you're all paperless, uh, you're already far, far beyond where you are now. So that, that's it. So invest in the doers, identify the doers, invest in the doers, and uh, give them projects which, which are meaningful for the company. And then you can have your garage, you might have might build a separate building and have the Wild West in there, you don't need what, know, know what they do. Uh, you get some graduates who think that we are anyway obsolete and have done the wrong things over the last years, and they, they should develop their new ideas, but that's a very different concept, I, and I think you need both. You need an innovation lab for crazy ideas and, and see what comes out of that, and maybe that brings you to the lead of the, of the whole industry, and then you need to, to identify the doers and have, have, use them to do the necessary. 
I, well, I, I would agree with both. I think the challenge for a lot of companies is the, the traditional idea of how to get, um, how to create ideas, ideation, things like that, aren't relevant anymore. The, the, the idea of a suggestion program and things like that are just incredibly dated. Uh, the, the, the other big problem that has always existed is giving people ownership. And if you want to really spur doers or innovators, they've got to have a sense of ownership and a, and a, and a way to bring their patient forward. Uh -huh. And I think that's a challenge to, to a lot of companies to figure out how to do that. Um, I think companies need to be smarter too. And, and I mean, I've been part of two startups in my life and I think the really interesting thing is in both of those, over the course of the first year and a half, what we thought our initial commercial model would be and what it ended up being, ended up being very different. Um, and, and I think that talks to the adaptability of, of the way people think. Uh, it's not always about having a, a specific solution, but it's having a broader solution in mind and being able to adapt when you hit a challenge. And, and to me, that's really, really important for companies as, as they think about bringing in-house what traditionally has been done outside. Yeah, one, one other pass which we have touched upon, but maybe not elaborated enough, is acquisition, in fact. If you don't have the right people inside, don't, don't recruit and maybe buy the company with it where, where they are. And, and I believe don't buy small. So buy something bigger which has a chance to survive next to the, the traditional business. Yeah, I think that's an important you know, point I, I would, and I would agree with that, but I think the key is when you buy like that, you can't, sometimes we, bigger companies, we love to buy things, and then we love the concept, and then we immediately kill it because we want to love it too much. <laughs> you, you need to give that, that organization that you buy room, especially if it's an innovative company, to still grow and act independently within a corporate structure. Because if you don't, you just bring it in and you smother it. That's why I said it has, has to have a certain uh, yeah, size. Totally agree with you. Well, I love the doer uh, attitude, uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, unsurprisingly. Uh, so maybe the guy who raises the hand or the you know, a female colleague um, doesn't necessarily have to be an executive. Right? I think that's almost also your intention. Uh, but you know, typically you have you know, project owners and you know, the more important <laughs> the project is for the CEO, the higher the hierarchy guy who is actually running this program officially is, but of course he's not able to do this stuff um, you know, himself, right? Uh, so of course I would be, so my overall objective is that telecom is applying the approach in which our teams work to the you know, official innovation uh, um, you know, projects or to the official corporate agenda topics. Um, and you know, start from the customer perspective right away and not only have doers but also developers and designers uh, as part of this team. And that's also reflecting this you know, whole technology or digital uh, digitization discussion which is going on. Um, so Deutsche Telekom is a company which is more a project organization, project management organization, right? We have a huge procurement department and more or less all the digital systems we are running are being created by suppliers, right? So IBM, SAP, Salesforce and the like, you know, and tiny, tiny expert, you know, companies which provide these systems. And also our website and, you know, back-end systems, more or less, are all done by suppliers. And that's, you know, um, maybe very efficient if it's not the core business, but this very digital, you know, value creation is becoming the core of, you know, all uh, business efforts. It's all, you know, if you look into how digital companies work, like we all know the you know, famous ones, right? And ask yourself, well, who is the supplier of their products? And then you go to the offices and you, then you will find those very you know, developers and designers. And that makes, you know, not only creates a, a unique knowledge within this organization, but also makes you um, adaptive and fast, right? Um, and in this sense, I think the value creation depths in digital terms for most of the companies which are like Deutsche Telekom, I would assume that pretty much of you are also less a digital company and maybe more a project you know, management company, having a big you know, supplier uh, uh, you know, number of suppliers providing you with the digital interfaces. Um, we have to you know, uh, bring this value creation to the very core. 
And that's, I think that's the, the major challenge because innovation, last remark, innovation always has a surprising aspect to it. You cannot, you know, plan how the innovation, you know, innovative result will actually be. You cannot, right? You have to start and if you're at the corner X, then you can see the next, you know, corner, which you couldn't see before. And then you have to, you know, take your new decisions, right? I would assume that Amazon Web Services wasn't on their list when they started as a bookstore, right? But then they did because it was an opportunity. And then you have Werner Fochus, you know, a genius uh, who is actually running this uh, business, right? Uh, and uh, so that's, you know, I think the challenge from the organizational and transformational point of view. Um, and the more people you have in your organization who know, you know, how this, you know, new world or existing world already actually works, um, the more adaptive you will become. And I would also, you know, agree uh, getting there might, uh, might require to have uh, uh, acquisitions or maybe reverse acquisitions, right? You know, a former startup requires the mothership in 10 years from now. I was just going to say, I think one of the really interesting challenges that corporations have is that that path to innovation and how to create value is never straight, right? I mean, it's going to have some turns. We tend to still think about things in very traditional, what's my return on investment? And I think when you start thinking about how do you, how do you seed innovation in a company, you have to redefine some of those KPIs because they'll become a roadblock to creativity and to that kind of investment. And, and certainly I haven't solved this, but I think you guys are further down the road on that because you don't look at it the same way that a traditional company would look and say, uh, what's my ROI, what's my, what's my payback period, those kind of things. You know, I'm struggling as well, right? <laughs> so, you know, I'm pushing my organization as good as I can. Uh. I think it's also about the, the people themselves, right? So, yeah, we, we can all have innovative ideas, but then the, the internal dialogue says, yeah, but, you know, I got this to do, and you, you wind up talking yourself out of it, where if you have that culture, where you have that supportive mechanism, whether it's, you know, the broader organization or your direct line managers or whatever that, that actually support and, and help you think about that and help you overcome your fear, right? Because that's... That's part of what, what stops that. You know, I'm sure there's a, I'm sure everybody in this room, you know, hold up your green cards if you've had an idea that you didn't, that, that you thought, yeah, this is going to be a million pound idea. How many people had a million pound idea? Thought they had a million pound idea. All right, very few. Maybe, see, that's fear in the audience, right? <laughs> that's belief. But, and uh, you were going to make an investment right here. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, let me open it up to the, uh, to the audience. Are there any questions from the floor? There's one at the back there. Sorry uh, to be so prosaic. Thomas Cullen, Transport Intelligence. I'm uh, constantly bombarded from investors asking me why uh, DSV makes so much money as a logistics service provider. Um, you, you have absorbed a uh, huge, I mean, with UTI alone, you've absorbed fantastically successfully uh, what was quite a large and also a very difficult to manage company. Um, if you make comparisons with other large logistics service providers, not too far away from here, um, they have faced really serious issues. I know that some of them still have, I think, 200 or more different IT systems in their company, which has come at a price. So how does DSV do the acquisition and digestion thing, particularly in relation to IT? Yeah, great question. I came through the UTI side of the, the acquisition, so, so I, you know, I've got kind of two different perspectives. I, I think the thing that really impresses me with, with DSV when it comes to their acquisition strategy is, is, is it's not just to buy, but it's to buy smart. They, they really do their due diligence, so they know what they're buying, they understand what the systems are uh, that they're gonna buy, and they, they have a plan before, you know, before that deal is ever signed that says, here's, how, here's what we're gonna sunset, here's what we can sunset now, here's what may take a little longer. So it was very scripted. I mean, it was, I mean UTI was a, a big organization, essentially about the same size from a geographic scope and from a, from a people scope as, as DSV, but yet in, in you know, less than 18 months, they'd been fully, you know, they'd fully absorbed that organization and, 
and, and pretty much eliminated or sunsetted almost every UTI system out there. So, but it starts with doing your homework, right? Really good due diligence, knowing what you're gonna buy, know how you're gonna do it. And then I would also go back to, you know, I talked about, you know, what platforms do we use to, to allow us to, to carry out our mission? And, and at DSV, that was, you know, that was very well thought out. I mean, they've, they've got probably fewer technology providers in the same space than a, a lot of other logistics service companies. So if it's, if it's international, freight forwarding, we know what we're going to do. If it's road, we know what we're going to do. Um, you know, if it's warehousing, we know what systems we're going to use. So I think, uh, I think again, do good due diligence and then, and then really execute the plan. And, 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 they, and, and create some, some penalty internally, right? We have, we're incented to get off of those systems faster um, and, and penalized if we can't, you know, corporately. So, so I think, you know, it's aligning that after the, after the acquisition to make sure that, you know, you don't just forget about those old technologies and say, yeah, we'll get to that later. So it's, it's ruthlessness and DSV is no longer st stuffed with lots of legacy systems from UTI. Or any other acquisition they've made. So I don't know if I'd use the term ruthless, but it's certainly a, a dogged approach to making sure we eliminate things that don't add value um, and, and not, not, not suffering um, you know, long-term decommissioning projects. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the floor, the stage, comments? Right. I'd like to just come back to the, the kind of the, the world of getting actual investment you know, from whether it's angel investors or VCs or you know, that, that whole world is like a mindful right? And for somebody who's not really versed with that. You may be an engineer and you know, you're like, you've come up with this great idea, but how do I go and get funding, right? You know, we, of course, you, you've all been in with them in that world, right? And of course, Deutsche Telekom have their kind of VC arm, if you like, uh, and then invest in that. What, what, what's, what's the whole process around? What, what are kind of some of the experiences that, that you've had around that? The investor pitch is one of the, the more critical things you learn when you start up a, a company. Or, and, and I've had a chance to do it like on a couple different occasions. I think the, the one thing that, that really surprised me when I started going out talking to, to, to venture capital companies or smaller private equity companies that were focused on different technologies is they all ask the, the, the questions about your business model and your technology. But, but those get out of the way pretty quickly. It, it, it's interesting. You're really, you're really selling the team, uh, you know, yourself, the people that are on there, and your ability to create and adapt. And it goes back to, I think, what you said, too, around doers and, and adaptability. Uh, and, and I found that, that I spent way more time selling our team than actually selling a business model or the, the specifics around the technology. Yes, I would, I would uh, definitely add to that. So I believe that uh, what investors actually do, so all this ado with regards to due diligence and pitch decks and, you know, number crunching and back and forth and, you know, negotiating to their advantage, which is all, you know, all, all right, um, is building trust. Okay. So it's about building trust to the people you actually provide your money to, right? So what are they actually doing with my money? Uh, that's, you know, the underlying question. Uh, and uh, that's why they look into track record. What have they done before? Have they done other startups? Who is the counterpart? Which is the you know, third party VC who is also you know, putting money into this venture and stuff like that? It's, it's more or less only about trust and that's why the people are so important, right? Because you have to you know, create this, this connection um, and otherwise you, you know, as an investor you, you won't jump. And that's maybe also a reason for, you know, well, let me, very short story. So one of our projects uh, couldn't get investment from Deutsche Telekom, so they decided to take this business on their own behalf and run it for themselves, right? A year later, Deutsche Telekom invested. And I asked myself, okay, is this a bug or a feature, you know, from my project, you know, from my program point of view? Because I always believed, of course, if you have a great team, they can convince telecoms, uh, VC guys or investment guys, and then, uh, you, you will walk, uh, walk away, right? So take the money and build the business uh, together with the mothership. And it didn't work. Um, and I believe, so if you have just, you know, your team internally, you only have one investor, right? If you're a startup, you have more or less thousands of potential investors. 
And that, of course, raises the likelihood that you will become successful. Uh, and, you know, from this angle, you can then go back or, you know, have the relationship well run with your former mothership. And maybe at a later stage, when they understand what you're actually doing, or when the processes which are, you know, so slow have, you know, came to this point that they can actually make a decision, um, then you can get there. So the design principle basically should be a speed. So if you design kind of the innovation project, in these days, design it along a getting up to speed, right? And taking decisions yourself as a team speeds you up, providing the freedom uh, speeds the, uh, you know, the relevance up, relevance up. And you mentioned that, you know, it's about democratization. So it's democratizing the industries. It's also about democratizing the organizations, right? So the other day I called this, you know, imagine your organization being like an organization of grown-ups. Yeah, I, you, you have the two angles, right? You are a corporate and I worked in a corporate and I was an investor. So, and you invest in, in small startups just to capture the opportunity and it's cheap. Uh, and that's, that's something companies do increasingly very systematically. Uh, scouting the market, what is out there, and in logistics, there are hundreds of startups now, not thousands. Um, and uh, at the forum, we, invite, uh, we invited 100 startups in the uh, MENA summit, we invited 100 startups in the Latin America summit, we will invite 50 or 100 in the ASEAN summit and bring the, the large, we, we are uh, supported by the largest companies in the world, the largest together with the smallest, and uh, so that the largest have a, a better view on what's going on. And these are early, these are bets on, on smaller companies. And then you have the largest, which we have already spoken about. And then you have the very big one, UTI, which is strategic moves to, to and it's all investment in the future. And, and then you have, the, the startups themselves, you, their companies here were small, right? And uh, just, just the numbers, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm an angel investor and, uh, and, and I, I go this suffering journey of, of fundraising uh, with, with the startups I'm invested in. And, and there is, this is not a good place to be. If you are in Europe, it's not a good place to be. Uh, London is the exception. But here are the numbers. Uh, venture capital investment by, by continent, Europe, 18 billion. Asia, 71 billion. And catching up. US, 74 billion. So if, if, you, my, if, the, if I speak to the CEOs, they say we need to move, you need to open an office in Silicon Valley, right? Well, it's, just, it's just too hard to get money. It's very hard to get money in Germany. So I, I think that's, that's, that's what we did, the two perspectives. And, and it comes back to places. If you want to be innovative, go to an innovative place. Be where the innovative people are. That's it. And, and usually they are. That's, that's in fact, my, my personal theory about where innovation happens is in the beautiful people, uh, places. Because <laughs> the, the, the smartest people, they go to the most beautiful places, so, whether it's San Francisco, yeah. whether it's, yes, uh, and bon it's nice. London. I, and whether, so, yeah. I was born in Bonn. That's, that's a right. very beautiful place. <laughs> and we're becoming more innovative, right? Isn't it? So we have, we have all the big companies. We have the UN here. We have you know, Fraunhofer. And there's so much diversity in this small place. And you know, Palo Alto is also a little town. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah. I would, I would go back to your, your initial question about you know, fundraising and, and going to venture capital and, 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 and what they look for. I would also tell you that in places like the Silicon Valley where there, there is access to capital, it's not getting the money, it's, it's how do you use the money. And I think there as a, as, as a startup, you have an opportunity then to, because you know you're going to get the money if you've got a good idea then you're really interviewing that, that VC firm to see what can they do for me? What are they going to bring to, to, to my idea, my company, in terms of um, you know, access to, to other collaboration opportunities, mentorship, all of those things. And that's, that's part of the secret sauce of those, those, those startup clusters, right? Is it's not just about the money. It's about the, the mentorship and the other access you get which make them very, very attractive places to go and take your idea. And it's, it's an awesome. ecosystem, it's, right? It's, it's, it's building a relationship, right? Building yeah. relationships is very personal, and that compares to your functional department, you know, thinking in a corporation. 
you know, when it comes to you know building a network uh, across companies or two startups or two investors, it's also a very very personal very personal thing. Coming back to this business angel uh, you know uh, scheme or having you know people who are maybe not from their you know um, uh, corporate card point of view in charge of officially innovation or officially whatever, but who have a good relationship within the system, you know, take it from there and build on those build on those systems. You know, finding an investor is like finding the love of your life in a way, right? You cannot intentionally, you know, plan, I now go out and find my investor. That doesn't work. That does you know, simply doesn't work. It's about relationships and that's also a long shot. So it's it's better to start today than tomorrow. So you have to kiss a few frogs to find your <laughs> Yes, two prints, yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> Okay. Well, just I guess we're we're nearly out of time yeah, in, in that respect. So I would like to just say, you know, uh, one piece of advice. If you were to give somebody one piece of advice, what would that one piece of advice be? So it's more about in supporting innovators. In the it's, it's about supporting innovators in the first place. It's less about the ideas, and you know, um, as an executive, uh, you know, prepare yourself to be surprised with the outcome instead of having the, the outcome be what you think is right. Yeah, as I said, identify the, the doer energy in your company. My only advice, I think, because I think those are all really good things, I would, I would look at it from, from the person that's got the idea. I think if you've got a great idea and you're passionate about it, then, then you have an obligation to yourself to figure out a way to, to bring that forward, either inside your current organization or to step out and, and actually do a startup and go out and find that money. Um, and, I, and I think that th those are some of the most rewarding things you can do. And, and we kind of talked about this, right? I mean, it's, uh, every day is a challenge when you're doing a startup. Every day is, is intellectually fascinating in, in terms of what you're, you're used to. You know, every, every paycheck that you've got to write or, or hope you can write is, 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 is critical tension that drives you forward. And I, and I think if you've got that patient, then, then by all means, find a way, find an avenue to, to take that. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've, we, we've come to the end of, uh, of this session. So I'd like to thank uh, the panel here for, uh, for a fantastic discussion there. So thank you very much. So this time next year, when I ask the question, uh, how many uh, people have invested in startup, we'll, we'll have a sea of green, right? Uh, and of course, if you need any advice, I'm, I'm sure uh, the gentleman up here would be more than happy to, uh, to, to give you some advice and help you, you drive some of these, uh, these innovative ideas that you have and to help you overcome some of that fear and, and find, uh, find the direction. So um, we'll be back here uh, in this room for, for 11 o'clock uh, where we'll have the, the think tanks. So uh, please uh, uh, enjoy the, the, the tea and the coffee and uh, we'll see you back here at uh, 11 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs>